athlete workshop, it's really important that there are a ton of, as you said, like just the, the one, two, three activity we're talking about, things like that. Anything you can throw in that gets the kids actively engaged, moving, talking, discussing, um, the better. I really don't use a ton of slides for this workshop. I have them up and I use them for videos and I use them for a couple of visuals here and there. But anything that I can do actively with the kids that takes the place of slides, I do it. And a lot of times when I do an activity or an exercise, I will just skip the next three slides because they already got so much more out of it by doing. So um, what would be helpful to you? Well, for, um, and I'm not, Christian, feel free to uh, talk, you know, is this is something that I, I right now could go out and do this fine, you know, because yep. I know the stuff, but it's really more about developing a way of doing it where the one thing I loved about Ken and Ken Revisa is my mentor and he just passed away is he had a way of kind of bringing something in, having it be very much like there was a narrowness to it and then something mm -hmm. going on and then backing out. And what yep. I noticed when I heard you talking uh, in the, in the other one, there was a way that it was structured to where I guess a good example would be when you were talking about the mass, well, we were talking about what you wanted athletes to get from it when it was repeated back. What did you want to get? And the idea was, you know, control the controllable aspects, you know? Mm -hmm. So having that in the back of our head and then gearing the discussion and the activities towards that so we can take something that's a lot of information and we can sequence it in a way where the main points and the main themes are, are hit on with activities to back them up. So that's really yes. what I'm looking for. It's just how to sequence it and how to involve the, the athletes in it to where the, I can walk away from there and say, okay, you know, Elm Tree, mastery focus, you know, controlling, the tr okay, boom, that was, I know at least the top-notch stuff was, mm -hmm. what, what, so that's really what I'm looking for. It's just, okay. really, and to me, so that means how it's talked about, how it's sequenced, and then how each slide builds into each other slide and how it then leads to some sort of activity with the kids or the different ideas of how it, it, it can work into an activity so that we're, we're getting, you know, so that's, I, if that makes any sense, that's what I'm looking nope, for. No, it does. It totally does. So I think, let me, let me start with a couple questions. So when we do these athlete workshops, you can, it can run the gamut. Like you could get an athlete workshop that is one single team of captains, hand chosen athletes that they'll pick to come to this workshop and you'll get 30 to 40 of the cream of the crop of the school. And you're just like cruising because these kids are into it. They all want to get better. They're yeah. just focused and they're awesome. Other times you'll get, like I'm doing one next Tuesday for 350 athletes, every fall athlete in the school at a public high school, you'll get kids that have never played that could care less that are, you know, the bench warmers, you'll get the captains, you'll get everybody there. So, you know, number one, the most important thing is that this workshop is going to be valuable to all of them, mm -hmm. whether you are the captain starter, or you have not seen a minute of playing time since you started high school. The kids all, their attitude basically is, oh my gosh, this is going to be a class where I'm going to be bored out of my mind for the next hour. Because that's what they think as soon as they walk into a room, auditorium, and they see a PowerPoint, they kind of shut off their brains. So coming in as a, as a workshop facilitator, what, how could you start this workshop so that the athletes know that there is something in this for them? There's something so valuable in this not only in sports, but you can help them with school, you can help them with relationships, you can help them with life. And the end result is going to be they will be more successful. And, you know, sometimes I used to I used to go in and say, how many of you would like to play sports past high school? You know, and you might get half the kids that say, you know, whether they want to or not, they'll say they do. And I would start off by saying, okay, what we're going to share, what I'm going to share with you in this workshop today are some of the things that I wish I had known when I was in high school, that We've gotten from the best athletes in the world, from the best coaches in the world, from the best sports psychologists in the world. I'm sharing this with you. I'm not the expert, but I'm sharing with you these secrets that people have told me that I wish I had known. And that makes people perk up a little bit. Mm -hmm. But the problem is half the group probably doesn't want to play yeah, in yeah. college. And then they're like, well, they're just going to be talking to the star athletes again. And that's what I'm used to anyway. Yeah. So how could you start a workshop like this? to let them know, because every kid's going to sit there like, what's in this for me? That's just natural in high school kids. What's in it for me? Why yeah. am I here? What do I need to know? How could you start this out so that every kid in the room feels like it's intentionally for them and they're going to get something out of it and it's going to be something they enjoy in the next hour? Well, I mean, I, this is a great discussion here because I have a little, some different things. So I'll talk about having a wild horse mind versus a racehorse mind. 
Mm-hmm. You're not, you know, anybody seen, a, and this is not just in, this can be where you're taking a test while you're studying or while you're at home or while you're competing. Anybody seen a wild horse? Anybody seen anyone try to tame or train a wild horse? Mm-hmm. You know, there's an old movie in the 80s, Black, Black Stallion. I don't know if you remember, but it's crazy. I remember right? that movie. Yeah. Yeah. And then, okay, but then that wild horse has to get to become a racehorse. Well, what's, what is a racehorse doing? What is it paying attention to? Actually, it has blinders on its eyes to do what? And then focus on what? And they'll say, winning the race. I'll say, well, it can't see the, it can't see the, the yeah. so then it's focusing on the next step, the next thing, you know? So mm-hmm. I do that. But one thing that might be good, that's, that's still more geared towards the athletes that really want to, are already stepping up saying, yeah, I want to succeed. I, 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 you know, those top level athletes. Right. Well, I would love to know something that you do or something that's been successful that really gets at the ones that are just there that might happen to play sports and the ones that are there that are extremely, you know, high level. Because what I found when I was working with club volleyball is club volleyball, even though they're traveling and they're paying, <laughs> it's not all competitive. There's plenty yeah. of kids there that are just there for the social aspect. So, so stop. So stop right there. Yeah. So there's plenty of kids that are there for the social aspect, right? Yeah. So you've got kids that are just there. Either their parents are making them play a sport. Maybe the school's requiring them to play a sport. What are they in it for? What is that group of kids in it for? Uh, they're in it for enjoyment, fun, right. um, social connection, yep. you know, interacting. Uh, right. they, you know, whether they realize it or not, they're in it for self-identity, um, right. you know, self-esteem. Right. So to, which one of our principals will tackle that? Well, you could start with the emotional tank if you yeah. wanted to, because yeah. that's the that's, emotion. Yeah, that's it. The emotional tank, filling, making their teammates better, filling the emotional tank will tap into all those kids that are just there for social reasons. They're there to make connection, make friends, have fun, enjoy it, be social, have kind of a, you know, a group of people to belong to. Yeah. And so you want to take that experience. And you don't necessarily have to say, this is for all of you guys out there that are, really aren't into sports. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they just want it for fun. But you're going to tap into that population of kids when you talk about emotional tank. Um, and then there's other kids that we've met that have said, you know, I'm not a really good athlete, but this is going to look really good on my resume. You know, mm-hmm. I'm kind of doing it to, you know, my parents say I should be more well-rounded. So I have to play a sport. So this is what I've picked. And they want to be, maybe they want to be known as, you know, the, the, the best athlete, like, you know, the coach's coach, the kid, the kid, the coach loves to coach, you know, and that's where the integrity comes into. They want to be part of a team, but they don't want to just be part of any team. They want to be part of a team that's known as being having a great reputation yeah. and, and they want to be a leader on that team. So we hit hard with the leadership aspect as well. So I think if you just in your mind, if you just remember who you're speaking to and that you're speaking to the social butterflies, you're speaking to the ones that want to be leaders and you're also speaking to the ones that want to be Olympians. And, and if you can keep that in mind throughout the gamut of the kids that you're talking to, you're going to hit all of them at some point or another. So how would you lead it off? I mean, because right away, you know, um, like right away you get into who is the current or former teammate that you mm-hmm. most admire. I, I guess that's a good segue because that's not necessarily saying the best right. athlete or – but I thought I thought you had said in, in, the, uh, in the, 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 the recording, but you, you, you switched that to the best athlete that you admire or, or some athlete currently that you admire. Or I you- do teammate. I always say teammate. So, you know, it's, I just say, who's the current or former teammate that you most admire. And if they say, well, you know, if I, and I say, if this is your first time ever being on a team, how about a classmate that you most admire? Mm -hmm. So this is where the first discussion question, um, leads into them understand the idea is that they're going to be describing kids that are either focused on making their teammates better, focused on making their game better or focusing on making themselves better. Okay. And so this discussion is going to kind of tease that out, that every descriptor they're going to say of the current or former teammate they most admire is going to fall into one of those categories, either Got making it. themselves better, their teammates better, or their game better. Um, the best way, I believe, every single time to start an athlete workshop is personal story. They, athletes, more than anybody, they want to know who you are, why you're here, and why, why are you telling me this? So I start off every athlete workshop by telling them my story. You know, I tell them about my youth experience. I tell them about growing up with two brothers that used to beat the crap out of me. And that's how I got to be a good athlete. I talk to them about my high school experience, how I was a really fast runner. I had no footwork and no stick skills, but I was fast and I could get away with that. And then, you know, things I had to get, you know, the team that I was cut from, 
that I had to bounce back from. And then I ended up going, getting a scholarship to go to a division one school because I was literally, because I was fast. I, you know, I just, I just tell them all these things, the struggles I had, the, the, just, just tell them your story. And I think the more you can just be honest with them in the beginning, not too long, but then they're like, all right, I can relate with something she or he or she said at some point. And then you just, Hey, you know what guys? And when I stumbled across the stuff I'm going to talk to you about today, I felt that it was so valuable that I wish every high school kid, I wish I had known this back in high school. And I thought it was this important that I wanted to share it with you guys. Got it. So, you know, you might not connect to every single thing I'm going to talk about, but I guarantee it'll help you in one way, shape or form in your life or, or with school. I mean, with sports. And that's, that's really how I start. Not like here, I'm going to tell you how to play, you know, which I know you guys wouldn't do either. But I think that just you, the kids will lean in when they know who you are. You're going to gain credibility and you're going to just explain to them that you're trying to make them, you're just sharing information that you think is really going to make them better. Got it. So I, I, does that I, make do, sense? I actually do that. And that's, that's interesting. So yeah. that, that, that is something that I do. So yeah. High school kids will not listen to you unless they know who you are and why you're here. Yeah. <laughs> they could care less. So the very, now, now this part here, like the, um, and if you want to, if you guys want to make it bigger, if you can't see it, you can just click on the box that has the PowerPoint, but this part here, the kids, all they need to know here is that the idea of triple, you know, I always joke about like JLo, you know, the triple threat, you know, the, the singer, dancer, actor, whatever it is, yeah. we want you guys to be a triple threat. And if you think of any athlete that's at the highest, le- highest amount, highest level of the game that you play, I guarantee if you talk to their coach, they're going to say that athlete is constantly focused on making themselves better, their teammates better, and the game better. These are the three things that college coaches are looking for. This is how what they recruit. They're not just looking for the guy that has the highest statistics. Mm-hmm. They want to know which guy, which girl is going to make my team better. Got and it. which one do I not have to worry about? Am I going to have to worry about kicking him off the team freshman year in college because he's done something stupid? You know, that's important to these coaches. That's why they – they scour your social media. That's why they ask your coaches questions. That's why they talk to your parents. So yeah. that's as quick as I spend at this. Okay. And then I get in right away. First thing, you know, and what I do, depending on the size of the group, I get the kids up and moving right away. So yeah. I, I start every workshop with a competition all the time. Now, mm-hmm. whatever you want to do as a competition is fine. It can be like a rock, paper, scissors championship. If you've ever seen that done, they have a blast doing that. Yep. It I can, did that the last thing I did yeah that was awesome and you can do it with we've done it with 200 kids in a room I mean you can do it with a huge group it's a little crazy but you know they just get pumped up they get fired up and they start it just sets the tone for this is not going to be a lecture what are some what what are some options so I also yeah I like to do um if it's a group of about like 50 or less or even 40 or less I do a competition where I'll split the room in half and I'll have this side of the room and I'll say okay on the count of third when I say go you need to put yourselves in, in birth order, birthday order, age order, not age. I'm sorry, not age, birthday. So if your birthday's in January, you're going to stand in the front of the room. If your birthday's in December, you're going to be the back of the room. I don't care how old you are. January 1st birthday is going to be here. December 31st birthday is going to be in the back of the room. And they make two lines kind of facing each other, but two parallel lines. When I say go, the key is there's no talking. The only person is the first person in line. So I ask this side of the room whose birthday is closest to January 1st, that person's a team captain. Over here, whose birthday is closest to January 1st, you're the team captain. So then I'll say, all right, Chris and Amy, you guys are the only ones that are allowed to speak. And the only thing you're allowed to say is finished. That's it. So when you think your team's in order and everybody gives you the thumbs up, you say finished. And Wait, they're they sitting- talk while they're- the, the, They're not the allowed to talk at all. Talk. Nope. Captains, captains are not allowed to talk. The only word they're allowed to say is finished. That's it. Okay. So, so, and I don't even have them get up first. I say, okay. And they're all seated when I'm explaining this. And then I'll say any questions. Cause I, whenever you explain an activity and you probably know this, whenever you explain an activity to high school kids, pretend they're in kindergarten, Yeah. like literally explain it as if they were five and they, and they still will have questions, <laughs> but have them repeat it back to you. Like, okay, somebody explain to me what I want you to do. And they will always try to cheat or find a loophole. So you have to be super, super clear. And they will also call you out if they think something's not fair. Mm-hmm. So hold steadfast to your rules, even if you've mixed it up. Like, hold, nope, this is it. This is the rule. I'm the official. No arguing with the official, whatever it is. Um, and there's even times where I've brought a whistle to an athlete workshop. And like, if I need him to stop, I'll, I mean, these kids are athletes. They're used to stopping when a whistle blows. So if they're in loud conversation, you just blow a whistle and they'll stop. It's like Pavlov's dog. Like they're just used yeah. to it. So it's easy. I actually had somebody ask me like, gosh, how do you get 300 high school kids quiet? 
I'm like, I blow a whistle. They're like, at a workshop? I'm like, yeah. They already know. You get quiet when the whistle blows. I don't have to teach them anything. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so then I say go. And the two, they get up and they're scrambling and they're, you know, using sign language and whatever else to get themselves in order. And then the first person says, finished. And everybody has to freeze. And then they just go right down the line and they have to check it. And, you know, usually the first team finished, somebody's out of order. And the team is like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe you blew it. You know, you suck, whatever. And, I'll be, and that's when I start going, all right, come on, we're going to flush it. We're going to move on. Let's go to the other team. And you just start putting in the language. Mm-hmm. Everything that you do puts in the language. And then the next group, you know, they're lined up. They're in order. And, you know, you give them a round of applause and whatever else. So then you've got them standing up on the side of the room. And they're mixed up. And they're purposely mixed up so nobody feels awkward. Like, high school kids really don't like it when you say find a partner. Because if you tell them to find a partner and their best friend is on the other side of the room, they're going to go to every line to go with their friends. And so I always say, you know, I purposely put them with the person next to you, the person behind you, the person in front of you, the person with the same color eyes as you have. Find somebody with the same color T-shirt you have on. You know, something where it forces them to be with somebody so nobody's left out. Nobody feels awkward. But once you have them lined up on the side of the room, then you can say, All right, I want you to get into groups of two right here. First two, second two, third two, all the way down the line. And I want you to share. Talk about the current or former teammate you most admire and why. Mm -hmm. And they just talk. And then what I always do, and I have it actually in my bag, I bring a ball to every workshop. And I have little ball and big ball and whatever else. I have a whole bag of all different size balls that I bring to every workshop. And and I also bring a blow-up beach ball, which is this my flat beach ball, but I have a beach ball always in my bag. And, you know, I might, I don't use the tennis ball anymore because I broke a light at the Hill School one time in Pottstown. They were not happy with me. So I have like just little foamy balls and I have a bigger one too. I don't know where it is right now, but I'll just, if I want kids to share something, I toss them a ball and I'll say, okay, somebody share for me. What did your partner say was the current or former teammate they most admire? I also don't have kids share about themselves right away in a workshop because they feel a little awkward or Mm -hmm. embarrassed. So I'll say, okay, somebody share for me what your partner described. Who was the current or former teammate that your partner most admired? And you'll get many more hands up than if I said share about your own. And then it also helps like, hey, you know what? You were a good listener. I lost the ball. I don't know what happened. But, um, you know, oh, that was great listening. And you're constantly reinforcing like, hey, way to fill his tank. That was awesome. You know, good job. High five. High five your partner. I'm constantly telling him. High five your partner. Tell him your name. Always before they do anything, pair, share. I say, high five them, tell them your name. Um, And again, that just gets the kids to understand that this is important, knowing your teammates, knowing who's on your team, knowing your partner. So I'll get two or three from this side of the room to share, two or three from that side of the room to share. And then I'll say this one. When you hear the word competitor, what characteristics come to mind? Now, what I like to do with this one is now that you already have them lined up in two different lines, now I'll say, okay, now your job is when I say go, I want you to think about three characteristics of the word competitor and you're going to walk across the room and you're going to high five a person across from you and you're going to share that with them. And then I'm going to say, okay, also what I want you to do is think of a the person. same person or a, per- a different person. No, they have, cause they're the first time they shared with somebody next to them. Now they're walking across the room to find somebody on the other side of the room. So even in an auditorium, I've done this in an auditorium, they kind of walk in between the rows and the aisles and they all end up meeting in the center aisle which, you know, isn't a bad thing because I've had trainers say, oh, it's in an auditorium. We can't do anything interactive. And I'm like, I disagree. You've got aisles. You've got the front. You've got the back, you know, got so it. whatever you want to do. But then they end up in the middle talking about the word competitor, what characteristics come to mind when they think of competitor. And that's where I'll take a ball and I'll just pass it around. Like, think about words that come to mind when you hear the word competitor. And I'll pass a beach ball around and they'll catch it and they'll say strong, tough, resilient, you know, hard worker, blah, 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 blah. And it's just fun. And they just, if a kid gets a ball thrown to him, he'll catch it and he'll give an answer. Um, sometimes if the kids don't want to answer, they'll throw the ball over their head again. And I'm like, that's fine. It doesn't matter. But it. it just makes it a little more fun. So, I mean, this is still the beginning of the workshop. And they've already, they've been standing the whole time now. Yeah. This now, this, next, this, now, how quickly should, this is three, four slides. How, you know, yeah. what is that? Maybe 10 minutes? Not starting? yet. About 10 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Pretty quick. Um, I'm going to let you know this and please do not take this as gospel. I don't like this slide (laughs) with the pictures on it. I think it's, I think it's hard to see. I like the point behind it, but I think in a room, I don't find the value as much in it. Other trainers I've seen have used it and they put the kids in four corners according to, you know, which, which one of these really exemplifies a true competitor. 
you know, eh, it's just me personally. I just, I've never found a ton of value in it because I think unless you're in a small room, like a small classroom and they can really see it well, it's hard to see. Yeah. So, but if you're going to do it, I mean, it is a creative way to get them to four corners of the room and have them. If you think number one is showing, you know, aspects of a true competitor, go to that corner. If you think two, if you think three, if you think four, and it's, I mean, the idea behind it is great because it shows the different areas that contribute to being a good competitor. You know, you're, Mm -hmm. they all say number one, number two is shaking an opponent's hand. That's part of being a good competitor. Three is celebrating after a championship. Of course, that's being a good competitor. And four is somebody that's, you know, obviously a teammate that's trying to support his own teammate. And that's important too. But I don't know. I, it's kind of hit or miss for me. I'm not a, I'm not a huge fan of that one. Got it. Yep. And then this is next. Um, the triple Incom- impact competitor self-assessment, which if a lot of them have books at the workshop, if they have the book, this is a really, then everybody's been up. They've been laughing. They've been joking around. Have everybody go back to their seats and they are sitting quietly in their seats and you have them open up to page eight, I believe seven or eight. I can't remember where it is right now. I think it's seven, seven. Yeah. Open up to page seven and we're going to do an assessment to see how well you do in all these different areas. So um, if they don't, and the other thing too, that I think is worth, um, you can invoice PCA for it too. I go buy a huge bag of um, golf pencils Mm because high school kids will never have anything to write with. (laughs) Even if they're told to bring something to write with, they never do. Got it. And if you bring them pens, which I made the mistake the first time of bringing all these pens that had clicky bottoms, which was the dumbest thing ever, because then the whole workshop, every kid was like clicking a pen. Uh Oh, so, and for some reason they don't steal golf pencils, they steal pens, but my golf pencils, I always get back. So just bring a bag, you know, spend 10 bucks on a bag of golf pencils. It's totally worth it. Um, but they can do this triple impact competitor self-assessment. And I say, okay, now let's see how you're doing in these areas. And I want you to be honest. We're not going to share this with anybody. I want you to be honest with yourself. And I read through them one at a time. Just number one, my teammates or coaches would say I, and it's, and it's purposely written that way. So it's not them reflecting on themselves. It's what would Mm. other people say about you? Yeah. And then they have to rate themselves, you know, that statement one through five, one, would they say you never do that? Or five, would they say you always do that? Got it. And I read them again because you don't know what the reading levels of the kids are and you don't know the language barriers either. So I just read through them one at a time. Got it. And then how would you, what would you do after this? How would you guys use this as kind of a launching point or how would you wrap up this activity? How would you find this valuable? How would the kids find this valuable? You want to try Christian? Uh, no, I don't. You're doing, you're doing great. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Way to pass the buck. Good job. No, I think it makes them realize that, um, you know, there's, there's going to be some self-reflection here too. So, you know, we're kind of now we're sitting down, we're kind of thinking about things and now we're into the more, you know, the more thoughtful part of the program. Um, but you know, something that they can, that they can use, they can reflect on, they can say, you know what, I'm not real good in this area, this area, this area. And now how can I, how can I use this workshop or how can I use what, you know, whoever, whoever's going to be there, how can I use this to improve, you know, myself, my season, my teammates, Mm -hmm. uh, the game and so forth. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's a great way to put it. That's a great way to put it. Um, the other thing is you're, you're sending them home with a book, you know, not very many pages in it. I think there's a uh, 92 pages in it, but mm. what are the chances that every kid's going to go home and read this book cover to cover? Mm, every kid, 0%. Right. <laughs> maybe a few kids, you know, you'll get a few, you get a few that will, um, every question on this assessment corresponds to a chapter in the book. So what I have them do is anywhere that you have circled, you've put a one or a two circle that Um, and definitely look at the table of contents and find those chapters in the book because they are written for you and they're ways to make you better in the areas that you're weak. And then I say, okay, which areas did you put a four or five, put a star next to the ones that you put a four or five next to that's where you're a leader on your team and your coaches are going to be depending on you. That's a strength of yours to help lead your team in that area. And when I say leader, I don't mean captain. And I push that throughout the whole workshop too. Anybody is a leader. As mm-hmm. long as you're a member of a team, you're a leader. I don't care if you're a freshman or if you're a senior. And that's where your coach needs your help leading in that area. So that's how I use it. Um, and the kids, I'll, I'll see the kids like paging through and like trying to find the page that they're, you know, the correspond with what they're talking about. The one the kids um, really like when you start talking about it, number four, about being a 24-hour athlete that manages diet, hydration, and sleep. That's where they're like, oh. Like, I definitely don't sleep enough. And, you know, maybe that Snickers bar before practice isn't the best choice. You know, how's that? What's that going to do for you? So, and there's other kids that say, I'm really good at that. So I always bring that up as an example because it's not, 
you know, it's just, it's just, are you aware of your health or not? So it's a non-threatening way to say, yeah, Hey, if that's something you're good at, help yeah. your teammates out. It's non-shaming. Cause most of yeah. some kids are probably even proud of that. I don't exactly. care. Yeah, exactly. I used my, two my, best, before my best, my literally my best games playing baseball in college where I was hung over as all get out. <laughs> I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend it, but yeah, my <laughs> husband always tells my daughter, my husband was a, a swimmer at West Virginia and he tells my daughter all the time, like, before his huge meets, they'd go to like Burger King and they'd eat like, he'd eat like two double whoppers and a Coke. And my daughter's a senior, you know, was a swimmer this year. And she's like, oh my gosh, I had to eat like quinoa and protein and lean and chicken and, you know, drink ah. this green tea. And my husband's like, I like did great on two cheeseburgers and a Coke. You'll be fine. Don't worry about it. Yeah. So then again, then you just get into the principles. So the principal part so, so is So is like, there any sort of group activity you can do with this, this is self-assessment? I mean, the, um, so if, oh, that's, thank you for bringing that up. If they don't have books, how could you still do this self-assessment? Cause it's on a slide. How could you still use this effectively if you don't have books? Um, well, see, the, see, here's what I'd say is like, um, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think I, I remember one being talked about in the, in the, in the, the, the video you had me watch, but I think you just gotta be care, care, careful not to, you know, call people out on things. And I don't, I wouldn't want to, you know, have, you know, shame anybody for what they're going through. But if, if there was, I don't know if there was a way, like, you know, um, you know, maybe you could go through the numbers and be like, you know, who has fours and fives on making myself better? You know, who's got mm -hmm. fours and fives? Where are they? Stand up. Mm -hmm. how, how did you get to be a four or five there? What's, what's really important to you with regards to this mm -hmm. one? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can make it a conversation. It depends on the size of the group too. Usually the average size for the work, these workshops is about 30 to 40. So I think, you know, if they don't have a book, there actually is a PDF of this that if you feel like copying it, you can photocopy it for them and bring it. But sometimes that doesn't happen either. And you have athletes sitting there that have nothing to write with and nothing to write down. I've seen trainers that have brought index cards and have the kids write down like one through nine and just do it themselves anyway. Or I did it one time with a group that they said they were going to have books and then I got there and they didn't. And I had them stand up. I put, I said, okay, you know, and I put a line on the front board and I said, this is number one on this side and nine's all the way over here. And I want you, I'm going to read each one and I want you to stand in front of the number one through five. I'm sorry, one through five, not one through nine, one through yeah. five. And they actually moved like one means I never do this. Five means I do. And every question that I read, they moved to one side. It's a value line activity mm -hmm. and they moved from one side to the other. So I mean, in a, in a auditorium or a room, you could have them like, okay, one is going to be, you never do this. You're going to stay in the front of the room. Five means you always do this. You're going to stay in the back of the room and you could have them move to the front and the back of the room, you know, whichever, however creatively you want to do it. You know, one thing that I, I, I trainers just have them put their fingers up, you know, I'm just going to read as I read it, vote one, two, three, four, five, you know, how would you vote? One of the things I do in uh, some of my talks that are more about self-esteem and psychology is. Um, there's a quote from my, my, my mentor in the, in, in the, in the psychological realm that, you know, it's the best in me that sees the worst in me. And so mm -hmm. I started about saying like, look, this is really about like what Christian said about having honest self-reflection. Mm -hmm. And when I see things that I need work on, that's the best in me seeing that it's mm -hmm. not worth being shamed about. And then I might give an example. So for me, number three, you know, I had a hardest time with my mental game, mm -hmm. but you know what? There's a little stigma back then. You couldn't really talk about it much because you were seemed as weak. But I didn't really look into it, go get a book, go talk to somebody. Mm -hmm. So I really just knew I was having trouble mentally, but I didn't. So maybe I could say that, that I, would, I, would, I would rank myself as one or two on that. And then yeah. hopefully that would lead to the kids into being more humble and less judgmental. And maybe, yeah. you know, encourage them that like, hey, the more I really own up to something I need to work on, yeah. that's coming from the best in me, not the worst in me. Exactly. I just, That's I great. just always be scared that I'm getting into an environment. You know, I, I want to situate that correctly. So I don't have the kids that, you know, feel like they're struggling either a not do not be honest with themselves or B if they are honest with themselves, they feel stigmatized. Right. Exactly. And then you also get the kids that are like, you get the clowns in the room too. That'll be like, Oh, I gave myself a one for everything. Cause I suck. You know, like, and they're the ones that get the laughs and they get the roles and yeah. you don't want to take the seriousness out of it. So you have to just kind of be aware. I, I, I think this workshop is 90% reading the room and behavior management and 10% material. Yeah, no, <laughs> it I really agree. is. I totally it really agree. is. So you would say, so you'd say, you'd say, okay, so we have this room. Okay. And maybe you could even use like the balls that you have or something. 
from here to here is one, from here to here mm -hmm. is two, from here to here mm -hmm. is three. All right, here yeah. we go. I'm gonna, I'm, and then I'll have maybe, so, okay, you know, what's your name over there? Okay, read number one. Okay, boom, 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 boom. You're either one through five, pick a spot. Yep. All right. And then would you say, okay, you're a five. Wow, have you always been a five? Have you done some things very specifically to get you there? Can you mm -hmm. share with everybody how you got there? Mm -hmm. And then maybe you could say, wow, you know how honest you are. Love the fact that you own up that you're two. That's great. Hey, we yep. all need to work on things. You know, would I say, how, how would you go? Would you say, you know, do you know some things that you need to work on or? or yeah, I know? mean, either that's getting pretty individual. So okay. I think that might take a lot of time. I think it's better almost to stay more general. Like, okay. hey, those of you that are a five, you know, think about what you've been doing. Think about how you've been getting there. What's the process to get you at a five? I don't know that I would call somebody out individually mm -hmm. um, just because of time. Because got you it, probably got it, got won't it. have a lot of time to do it. But, yeah, I mean, I think if somebody, you know, if it's the only guy that's standing next to the five, you might want to say, like, hey, that's, that's pretty awesome that you're recognizing. And it's okay. Like, kids are pretty, as you said, kids are pretty self-deprecating. So it takes a lot for a kid to say, I'm a five in this. Yeah. <laughs> More kids are going to be lower than you'd expect because okay. kids aren't really boastful even though you think they are they they really are but it's hard to get a kid to admit they're really good at something in front of their peers so it takes okay. them it takes a lot of bravery to be able to do that all right i think i'm good on that one and then yep. uh, i guess we move on to uh yep other thing too just some just some tips my goodie bag here i always have uh i have numbers that i just got laminated and i bring numbers to every workshop so i'll oh, do i have cool. i have one through five i have the uh like the roots, R O O T S. I have those mm -hmm. letters on a card, and I just, you know, just printed it out and went to Staples and got it laminated. But I have so anytime I do an athlete workshop, I have like my bag of balls, and <laughs> I have a, you know, this is just somebody gave this to me too, like it's just a train whistle, you know, yeah. to get kids quiet, blown up beach ball, like a whistle, whatever I can find around just to help. So yeah, so then when you get into the principles, it's basically the same as double goal coach one. But again, you're coming at it from an athlete point of view. So Chris, I know that, you know, the mastery section, I think you're going to have nailed. That's not a problem. Um, what I do like to do, though, with this slide, and I think I've told you guys this before for Double Goal Coach One, rather than just going, okay, how does your team divide, you know, how, were you successful last season? If you were successful last season, what did you base that on? You know, even before I show them this, do you base it on the scoreboard? How many wins and losses did you have at the end of the season? Or do you base it on performance? And how well your team worked and how well your team improved. That's the two categories that we're talking about in terms of mastery. Um, and then I would actually, the one time I actually had two athletes get up and pretend that one of them was a win at all cost coach. And the other one was a mastery focused coach. And I said, okay, how will you address your team at halftime when you're losing? How will a win at all cost coach scoreboard definition of success only coach address his team at halftime? You've got 30 seconds to give us a halftime speech coach. Go. And the kid was so funny. Like they get up and they're like, oh my gosh, what are you thinking? You guys are better than this. Come on. You're down by this many, you know, and they just got really into it. And then I said, okay, now cut, you know, thank you. Now this guy over here, you're going to be the, you're going to be focusing on mastery. You're only looking at success in terms of effort. How much did they learn and improve? And that it's okay that they made mistakes. Give your halftime speech. And then I asked the players, which coach would motivate you more? And it kind of touched on like, well, that coach was yelling at me is definitely motivating because what you have to understand at the athlete workshop is that we would love to have every kid be coached by a double goal coach or a positive coach, but a lot of them aren't. And you're talking to the athletes right now, not the coaches. So you don't want to make the athletes feel like if they don't have a positive coach as a coach, they're screwed. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. you're done. Sorry. So you have to be able to equip them to be who they, like, really, they have to be strong in themselves. So if they do have a negative coach or a win-at-all-cost coach, how do you get beyond that? How do you still perform at your best? Mm -hmm. And, you know, we would love you to all have coaches that are based on a mastery climate, but you might not. Got it. So just, just a different way. So the, uh, the slides are, again, the response to mistakes. It's all pretty cut and dry. But I think in terms of tools to help the kids, if they have books, you know, it's great. Maybe take one of the tools. Um, you know, growth might, mistake ritual is a simple one. Have them all turn to page 30. Let's talk about this mistake ritual for a minute. What do you guys do when you make a mistake? What's the first thing that you do? And, and even have them stand up. You know, every, everybody stand up on your feet. All right, you just blew it. Whatever it was, you DQ'd, you struck out, you missed the shot. What did you do? On the count of three, I want you to show me how you would react the second after you've screwed up. And I say, one, two, three. And you just look out at the room and they all go, ugh. Like everybody's head goes down. You know, so... Again, what is something, what if you had a magical tool that could just 
acknowledge that mistake and got your brain off of it and move on. So you can teach the whole group a mistake or a tool, yeah. you know, and teach like everybody that. the flush, teach everybody, brush it off. You know, I used to joke about the flush all the time that, you know, you get a bunch of seven or eight year old boys to talk about toilets and they just think it's hilarious. High school kids are even worse. Like high school you know, kids think it's so on the, funny. On the junior tick, I was, uh, I, it kind of backfired on me because these kids just start talking about poop. I'm like, all right, yeah, 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 that's it. Where's that? the poop go? <laughs> flush it. Yep, that's right. Where does the poop go? So, I mean, the point is to, and again, there's, there's a couple extra slides here. The idea of grit and setbacks, you know, sometimes I'll use this slide. Sometimes I won't. I think some of these slides are a little redundant, but you know, the idea, the word grit is, was the big buzzword um, the last couple of years in recruiting college coaches are asked, what do they, what are they looking for in the athletes they're recruiting? And I'm sure Christian, you can speak to this a lot better than I can, but the word grit kept coming up over and well, over that, and that over one again. book was written on grit. That was, uh, that was real popular passion yeah. plus perseverance. Yep, exactly. So, we so Brit was a buzzword. At Yale who, uh, we actually had a guy here at Yale who studied that uh, for us in the uh, School of Management. He said, we can mm -hmm. measure grit. Yeah. And, and he did it by, he analyzed like 100 of the top juniors. And when they lost the first set of like a major tournament, did they come back in the second and third set? And they mm. showed that, you know, th that showed grit because you stuck to it. You know, you stuck to the process. You stayed with it. And you battled, you know, so you're a competitor and all these things. So he said, we're going to try to make that be measurable. And it, it turned out to be almost not on the button, but it was pretty close with the guys who were more at the top of the rankings were guys who <laughs> lost the first set. But, you know, it was something that could be kind of measured, which was kind of interesting, you know. But, yeah. Yeah, that's it. They're, they're, you know, it's, it's an intangible thing, but also, you know, are there any ways you can put numbers of this? And that's just how the guy's mind worked, you know. Yeah. So it, it was fascinating stuff. Pretty interesting. So. It's cool. I, I took a course last summer with Dr. Angela Duckworth at Penn, and she's done yeah, she's a ton. The, she, she's, she's the one that wrote the, the book. book. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. She was phenomenal. Book. And I just happened to live, like, not far from Penn. So I took her class. And grit is absolutely measurable in her eyes. Mm -hmm. But, you know, again, that's a whole tangent you could go off of. But, you know, the kids have heard the word grit. So, I, I mean, Christian, that's a great example. Like, how would you measure grit? Well, this is what it means. In the face of adversity, in the face of disappointment, how do you respond? And it's as simple as that. How do you how do you bounce back resiliency, that type of thing? But this is what this is what the best of the best do. It's not that they don't fail. It's that when they do fail, they know how to respond to it. And so just talking to the kids about how, well, how do they respond when they fail? And I, I once had a, uh, my actually my college um, field hockey coach. I was talking to her about recruiting because she had been there for 20 years. And she said, I hate it when all these kids send me their highlight reels. I don't want to see the highlight reels. I want to see the areas when they screw up. And then I want to see how they respond. I want to see 10 seconds after the, me the mistake. And, you know, and I just remember that thinking, wow, that's so true. Everybody sends you the greatest plays ever. They don't show you the play that they messed up in their recovery. So uh, this then, the, the trend, this failure is not a person. It's a result you don't like slide is actually, I mean, it's dealing with failure and mistakes, but it's also transitioning into making their teammates better. Because when we talk about personal failure, personal mistakes, you know, kids are hard on themselves. But when you talk about failure as a team, most teams will blame. You know, as soon as the team starts to fail, they'll blame others. So the best teams out there are the ones that take the responsibility of failure as a team. And you can have, re you can have a resilient team. So failure is not a person. It's a result you don't like. It is just kind of a transition into the next principle, which is about filling the emotional tank and making your teammates better. So Perfect. then it just goes into, I think the Brad Stevens video is a great setup because the Brad Stevens video talks about, you know, and, and sometimes I, I always do like a leading question before a lot of videos. And I'll say, okay, let's say that you are um, a basketball player in high school and you want to be recruited to be able to play the division one basketball program. What do you think the coaches are going to be looking for? And I asked them and I just put it out there. And the kids always say, you know, maybe they're the best rebounder, the high scorer, the best shot block, you know, whatever it is. And they're just giving you stat after stat after stat. And I'll say, you know what? I want you to hear from Brad Stevens who is now coaching the Boston Celtics. He was one of the youngest NCAA coaches. Listen to why he recruited one of his players. And then, you know, the video plays in. Have you guys both seen this video? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the guy couldn't shoot, shoot, dribble, or I forget what the other one is, like shoot, block, or dribble, and he's ready to give him a full scholarship because his high school coach said he is the best giver and he makes the people around him better. And so that's, you know, I just think that's a great video for all high school kids to see because they're probably all not LeBron James worthy in high school and they think they don't have a chance. So, um, 
Again, empty tank and full tank, I think it's kind of self-explanatory. I wouldn't spend time wasting your breath on a slide with this. I think the kids can understand, you know, how are you going to play if you have an empty tank? How are you going to play if you have a full tank? You know, you get it. This one's fun for kids, what drains the tank and what fills the tank. And again, it just gives them an opportunity to get up and do an exercise. So whatever sport you want to pick, um, you know, I have a shooter. I'll ask the kid whose birthday is closest to today. And you'll always get a volunteer. My birthday is tomorrow. My birthday is last week. Yep. You're the basket. Okay, great. Pick one of your friends to be the shooter and they'll pick somebody. And, you know, again, the one kid will go up with his arms like this. The other kid will take the shot and I'll have a miss. And this side of the room, your job is to drain his tank with everything you have. Drain his tank. This side of the room, I want you watching and observing how they drain this kid's tank. And, you know, they, they miss the shot. And these high school kids will be ruthless. Like I always say, okay, keep the language PG-13, but do whatever you can do. And, uh, They'll just be screaming, and, uh, you know, and you suck and all this other stuff. And then I asked the group that was, see, what did you see? What did you see him do? And what did you see? The, how'd this athlete look? You know, or whatever his name is. Like, Tim. Tim was a shooter. How did he look? They just have fun with it. And then I'll ask the other side. Okay, you guys sit down. Now this side of the room, he's going to miss again. But now I want you to fill Tim's tank. This side of the room, watch what they do. And the cool thing is with athletes, when you tell them to fill somebody's tank when they've missed, it's like the most pathetic, ridiculous seen ever because they don't know what to do they'll be like good job like there's like a lull for a minute and then they're like yeah good job tim like so then point out gosh when i asked you to drain his tank the volume level was like through the roof when i asked you to fill his tank when he missed you guys didn't even know what to do so think about that in terms of culture society who's draining your tank when you miss a shot and they'll say my parents <laughs> my coach sometimes my teammates yeah but imagine, you know, you can talk too about the home field advantage part. You know, we want to bring that home field advantage. We want people to support you, whether in those mistakes, you're not afraid to take them. And then I, I always talk a little, I kind of blend, I like to blend the principles together too. Talking about, you know, the way when you drain somebody's tank as a teammate now, I, I leave the coaches out of it. If you drain somebody's tank when they make a mistake, they're going to be afraid to try. Do you want a teammate that's afraid to try, that's afraid to take risks, that's afraid to go out there and go after it because he's afraid he's going to get abused by his team if he misses and they're like no so we just talk about how in order to be a successful team everybody's got to be supporting everybody and you know what else um other ideas do you guys have any other ideas how you would do that with draining and filling or other activity ideas um so, you know some uh something like that i like the fact because when i heard this on uh, i was i was listening to it and like paying attention watching and listening when I was listening to it I was like wow you're gonna have kids drain tank ouch but then you you almost give them permission by mm -hmm. by by listing all the things that are tank drainers yeah so, so it's, it doesn't seem so personal because they're just ignoring or being sarcastic or or hazing you know because it says it on the screen yeah and then I like the 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 uh you know the the filling the tank thing so no I would just do some sort of thing like that okay all right, cool. And also, just, just a little FYI, on this slide, for some reason, it's supposed to be that the drainer is on one side and then the, act, the opposite of that is on the right-hand side. For some reason, it says nonverbals and then belonging on the what fills the tank side. Belonging and nonverbals should be flipped. So if you are good at editing PowerPoints. I don't know how that got yeah. through that squeak through there, but just an FYI. So if you're reading them like horizontally across, it goes ignoring What's the opposite of ignoring? Listening. Yeah. Nonverbals. What's the opposite of nonverbals? Nonverbals. Guess what? Nonverbals can be draining or filling. And then clicks. You know, what's the opposite of clicks? Belonging. How are you, how are you helping your team feel like they belong? Um, toolkit. Again, this is huge. And this is on page 50 and 51 if they have a book. Again, I go through this and I just say, look at this list. These are all the things that research has shown will fill the tanks of teammates. Which ones of those? I'm going to read them one at a time. And I want you to thumbs up if it's something that you do or something that would fill your tank. Thumbs down if you don't know. And I've done this before. Thumbs up if you like it or you think it would work really well on your team. Thumbs down if you think, now nah, I'm not really into that. Like, I don't need all the extra praise. And I said, put your hand up like this if you have no clue what it means. <laughs> and then, you know, you go through them. Names. Okay. Using names. Do you guys like that when people use your name? Yeah, they all do. Comings and goings. And you'll get the kids that are like, what the heck is that? I don't know. And, and you get all their hands up in the air. I said, I want to see. Like, what is that? I don't know what that means. Then take a second and explain that one. What does that mean? Um, you know, but instead of going now, comings and goings is, is like just, you know, 
uh, giving high fives and stuff when they come and when they go, that kind of thing. Yeah, like acknowledging, acknowledging players when they're there, acknowledging players when they're not there, just keeping ideas on, you know, keeping a good handle on what the players are up to. What are their comings and going? Did you check in like, hey, how was that history test today? Oh, my gosh, did that girl say yes? Did she go out with you? Like, oh, my gosh, what was your lunch? You know, just checking in, checking in on kids. Okay. And seeing what they're doing. But yeah, high fives, you know, making sure that every single person on your team feels like they're, they're there for a reason. They have a point. Um, and they're all, again, they're all on page 50 and 51. You can look through the details on Got those. It. But I don't spend 20 minutes on this going through every single one because they're not going to remember all of them anyway. Got it. So, um, and then leadership. Again, this is one, you know, I might have them stand. Stand if you agree it's leadership. Sit if you don't. Or clap. Just clap twice. Um, I'll have them clap twice a lot in workshops. Like clap twice if you agree. Clap twice if you do this. Because if you say clap once, you're going to get everybody like mishmash of claps. But if you say two claps, if you agree with that, and I'll make a statement and you'll hear, you know, two claps. All right, two claps, two claps. If you, you know, way to go, John. Because if you'd say round of applause for my volunteer, you're going to get 10 minutes of applause. If you say like, hey, Chris, that was great. Two claps for Chris. And everybody just says two claps and sits down. Just a good way to pump people up without a round of applause. But um, again, the leadership aspect, this is huge hitting all of your leaders. Sports, there's no better place to develop leadership skills than sports, just period. Um, you might discover leadership skills in math class. I don't know. I think you might dis discover a few more on this on the sports field. So read through this list one at a time. Clap to vote. Thumbs up, thumbs down, whichever you want to do. Um, and the freshman carrying equipment is going to be the most debatable. So make sure that you're ready to explain why telling freshmen to carry equipment is really not the best idea of leadership. And what if you're thinking about your team, we want belonging we want everybody to be responsible, everybody to have a role. What's the problem? I had to carry equipment when I was a freshman. Isn't that what you do? You know, you know just, the way, one of the ways I think you could spin this is you can say telling the freshmen carry fresh, uh, equipment to freshmen. No, I mean, we could say that that's not quite an inclusive team. Right. Being a freshman and being the first one to step up to carry equipment, that's a good message. Exactly. To, I'm a part exactly. of this team. I'm a contributor. Here we go. So there's a yeah. way of putting that together. Yeah. Exactly. It's very cool. My daughter's starting her sophomore year. She's and she's running cross country for the first time. And she noticed at practice today. She's like, N there's no equipment. <laughs> she's like, it's the first team I was ever on. There's no equipment. You just show up. I'm like, hey, you can't carry it if there's no equipment. Kind of cool. Um, and then, you know, kids like quotes, the positive team culture, Julie Foudy quote is great. I mean, that video is really good. Mm -hmm. This is the same one that's in double goal coach one. And, you know, just talking about the success of that team and the culture on that team. And the, the foundation that they had, you know, the way that they did things on their team was everybody grabbed a bag of balls. Everybody was part of the team. Everybody was just as important. Um, and then this team culture survey, again, it's something that I think is great on, in athlete workshops where you have one team. You might do a lot of athlete workshops where there's one team or the captains. I think if you're doing a big athlete workshop where there's 100 athletes from a million different teams – this one's a little bit tricky to do. I mean, it's a good activity, but it's not as valuable and it takes a lot of time. So I probably would skip over this one. It's in the book, so they can do it. Which, which one's this? This is the team culture survey where it says, what values do you want as part of your team culture? Um, you know, Got if it. you have a shortened workshop too, sometimes these athlete workshops are only an hour. And if you have that, I think, again, I think this is just, a, it's a good activity, but I would probably cut it if you had a bigger group. But if you're doing this with like just the soccer team or just a football team or just a tennis team or somebody, this is great to do because you get everybody on the same page. So Got it. you can do that the same way you would do the other one. Um, last one, honoring the game. This is really important for the kids. The kids are going to be like, well, this is sportsmanship. This is whatever. This is what the teachers, the parents, the kids, this is what everybody's proud of. They're, they're proud of you as an athlete, but they're also proud to say, you know what, my kid has just did the right thing, did the right thing when everybody else was expecting them not to. Um, this is where the team gets the reputation based on how, as a team, you honor the other teams and respect the other teams. So here's a scenario in a way. And, and the, the funny thing is the, the word heckling always cracks the kids up because they don't use that word. Um, I, I've, I've changed it sometimes to trash talking because the kids are like, what's heckling? Like, that sounds like it's from the 1980s, you know? So I put trash talking at the top. It's an away game, students from the other school or trash talking relentlessly you can even change it sometimes to be like an opponent because a lot of the trash talking happens when an opponent is saying it to somebody else not necessarily like fans but basically how do they handle it when there's adversity from the other team 
And then have them get in groups. Um, the nice thing about athlete workshops is you can group them according to the team that they're on. You can group them according to age, freshmen here, sophomores here, juniors here, seniors here. Um, you can group them according to their sport. Everybody, you have to have a group of five. Nobody can be on the same sports team. You know, just however you want to do it to get them mixed up is fun. And then here's the tools. Here's things that can help you. How do you handle it when somebody else is trash talking you? Um, so here's what I do for this, for Roots. And I showed you my letters. I always have the kids up and moving for Roots because I want to know where are they challenged? And I just tell them real quick, here's, here's the five things of honoring a the game. These are the five areas of respect. And I have the letters R-O-O-T-S all around the room, in the front of the room, wherever it works. And I'll ask them first, which one do you have the hardest time with? Which one do you have the hardest time respecting? And which one do you think 90% of the kids are going to go to? Officials for sure. Yeah, they always do. They always do. Except we did an ultimate Frisbee workshop. I had no idea there was no officials in ultimate Frisbee. So I thought that was a pretty funny question. Oh, and I was like, huh, yeah. nobody went to officials. No ultimate Frisbee ever has officials, which I didn't know. And tennis too. Like tennis doesn't have an official at the side of every game. So we have whatever you do. Right. Yep, that's yeah. Right. So the tennis players are like, I don't know. I don't have an official, but opponents are another one. So sure. know your sport is my advice for this, uh, this slide before you go into there. But mm -hmm. the kids will be really honest. And I'll say, okay, when you get to that group, Talk about why that's so difficult for you to respect opponents. Why is it so difficult for you to respect your teammates? And a lot of kids will go to self and they'll say, I have trouble because I'm so hard on myself. And that's when you can bring back, well, now, now you know about mastery. Now you know about the elm tree. You can help yourself through that. Um, but this, what can you do as an extension of this? The first one was, where do you struggle with this the most? What's the second question you can ask them so they can move around again to a different letter? Um... Maybe you could say what, what, which one do you think is the most important to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which one do you want the most help with? Or what, how about your team? You could always say, which one does your team struggle with the most? Uh, mm -hmm. Which one does your coach harp yeah. on you the most about? <laughs> so just another way so they're not just moving to one spot, get them moving around again. And which one are you the best at? Maybe sometimes say, which one are you, which one are you really good at respecting? And most mm -hmm. of the time they'll all say the rules or they'll say, oh, my teammates, I'm really good. And then you can share, like, why are you really good at respecting officials? What has your team done to make it really easy for you to respect officials? Mm -hmm. And this is like, this is where I always say like the Hollywood part of the workshops where you've got like the, you know, the movie noises playing in the background, how we be remembered. Um, these kids are not thinking about 20 years from now. They're thinking about like tomorrow. So just to get them at the end of the workshop, thinking about when they graduate within four years, they're all going to be out of there. Uh, when they graduate and they leave, they're going to leave behind a reputation. People are going to remember them. I guarantee it for something or another. So how will you be remembered? And this is something I have them just think about quietly, kind of rhetorically by your teammates, by your coaches, by other opponents. Um, this is the one that gets them. Like any of you have that little kid that just is so excited to come to your games. I mean, I had, a, I had a little girl that was so excited to come watch me play JV field hockey. And she would, nobody comes to watch JV girls field hockey. And this girl was there at every game because she was my neighbor and she thought it was the coolest thing. Are you making her proud? Are you making your parents proud? So again, you can make this as dramatic as you want to, but it's a good, <coughs> good way for the kids to be like, wow, you're right. It's not just about me. There is a big picture here. And how will I be remembered? And then again, you know, you can give them some resources. This is where I will have them pull. I'll tell them to put away their phones. Um, sometimes even if this is a workshop, I'll have them leave all their backpacks and all their stuff in the back of the room. I'll just have them line it up in the back of the room. And all I need is yourself to come down and sit down so that they don't even have a question about phones. If they have their phone with them, I'll say, leave your phones back there, leave everything back there. Um, if they do have a phone on them, what I might have them do is I want you guys right now to put in on your phone, PCADevZone.org, and they'll just look it up. And I'll say, now check this out. And I'll do this at, at coach workshops too. I'll have them just pull it up and pull up the website right here. And check it out. And then I'll show them like, hey, do you guys know that that little box down at the bottom with the arrow on it, you can click on that box and it'll say, make this on your home screen. Put this on your home screen. You can have devzone.org as your home screen. Anytime you have a question about sports, coaches, parents, athletes, whatever, boom, it's right there on the front screen of your phone. So it makes, it makes a website into an app. Look what I just did. I just made it an app for you. So they like it. And then I'll also tell them like, hey, if you guys have Instagram, Twitter, you can follow Positive Coach US on you know facebook they don't none of them have facebook but they all have instagram twitter snapchat we actually have a snapchat now too so they can follow us and that's it awesome yeah
So let me add two more things to this and then I will, uh, I'll see if you guys have any questions. Um, you are welcome to tailor this based on the sport of the athlete workshop and the school. So I encourage you to go on the school's website and, you know, put on one of the slides, like it, their, their logo, whatever, oh, fighting Trojans or we are the Wildcats and put their school symbol. I also um, say it's a great idea to know who they play, know who their opponents are. So when you get to the roots part, be like, man, I know how it is when you guys play those Wildcats. I've heard about that game. Or, you know, if you can say like, hey, football team, 9-0 last season, that was awesome. Or, man, the wrestling team, you guys came in second in the district. Like the kids are like, wow, that's, that's all. Just grab a couple stats off of their website and you'll get a ton of credibility there. Um, we also have a lot of videos on our PCA trainer share folder that you can add to embellish this. So if you know you're specifically doing basketball or you're doing football. We have a lot of football videos dealing with honoring the game. Uh, we have a great Chris Sock video for tennis. Um, I mean, not Chris Sock, Chris Hewitt and um, what was his name? Jack Sock video for honoring the game with tennis. There's a lot of soccer videos in there. So we actually don't have a ton of videos in here. There's a Shane Battier video on being a triple impact competitor that used to be in the workshop that I just loved. They took it out just to kind of refresh the workshop, but I'll put that back in too for this um a lot of the kids unfortunately don't all know remember who shane battier is so that's why we took out some of these because they're like who is that um even julie fowdy some of the kids are like well who's judy fowdy fowdy i'm like oh you're right you don't know her either but um you know any examples you can use that are more current they they like that that they appreciate that so anything you want to do to tailor this to meet the needs of the kids in the workshop you know you have our thumbs up you have our blessing to do it awesome Awesome. Yep. I'm going to be seeing Jim some something or other. Uh, Jim Perry, yeah. Yeah, he's doing a uh, TIC on next Monday, so I'll be seeing yeah, that. Yeah, he's a, he's a character. You're like him. Great. <laughs> yeah, he's a good guy. So anything right. else? I mean, I can help you guys through if you have any questions. or what. I still have trainers that constantly will be shooting me like, oh, my gosh, I forget. I just need ideas for how to make you know roots more interesting. Help me out. So, yeah, no, I, I, I'm, I think I'm good, but I'll, I'll definitely, you know, I'll be in touch for sure. I appreciate your, uh, you being there to help. Yeah, absolutely. I think the toughest thing about this one, as I said, is time and behavior management. Rarely yeah. do we ever get two hours to do this workshop, even though it's sold as a two hour workshop. Usually it's during a school block of time. It's about an hour. So yeah. you have to, you have to cut something out. You can't do every slide you can't do everything in it. So got it. just keep that in mind. Okay. All right, guys. Thank you so much. All right. Awesome. That Thanks. Was super. Terrific. Yep. All Thanks right, so Christian, much. I will uh, I'll see you tomorrow at noon. Noon tomorrow. Okay, sounds good. We'll see you then. Thank you. All right, thanks. All right, good Chris, luck, Christian. Nice meeting. Take care. Good luck to you. Thank you. Take thanks, care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.